Hey guys, it's Mrs. Barry. I'm coming to you from my VIP kid classroom. This is where I start my morning every day. And so I thought I would use it to share some more of our story. The Watsons go to Birmingham, 1963. We were in the middle of a chapter when we got interrupted the last time. So I'm just gonna start that chapter over again and share it with you. We're on chapter nine, the Watsons go to Birmingham, 1963. That Sunday morning, I got up early. There weren't any cartoons on then, but it was always fun to wake up and not to have to worry about going to school. When I got into the living room, I was surprised to see the front door open. I looked outside and saw dad sitting in the brown bomber. I guess he was listening to records because he had his arm across the seat and was beating his hand up and down like it was a drum. I ran back upstairs to the, to the bedroom and changed out of my pajamas. I peeked out of the bedroom window to make sure dad hadn't left. He was still in the room, so I ran downstairs and through the front door. I remembered and I caught the screen just before it slammed. I tapped on the window and dad turned and smiled at me, then pointed to the passenger side for me to get in. I ran around the car and climbed in. Hey, Kenny. Hi, Dad. How'd you sleep? Okay, I guess. Come on in and get yakky to yak and sit with me for a while. That's okay. I'll just listen to what you're playing. We listened to a couple of Jai songs and then I said, Dad, does Byron really have to go live in Alabama? Couldn't we just drive him to, down to about Ohio and pretend we were going to leave him there to scare him? Dad looked at me and kind of smiled slow. He reached over and turned the ultra glide down a little bit. Kenneth, I know you're going to miss Byron. We all will, but son, there are some things that Byron has to learn and that, and he's not learning them in Flint. And the things he's learning are things we don't want him to. Do you understand? No. Dad turned the ultra, ultra glide down a little more. He looked like he was thinking whether or not he should tell me something. He was looking straight at me. And even though it was real hard, I looked right back at him. I tried to look real intelligent and I guess it worked because dad finally said, Kenny, we put a lot of thought into this. I know you've seen on the news what's happening in some parts of the South, right? We'd seen the pictures of a bunch of really mad white people with twisted up faces, screaming and giving, giving dirty looks to some little Negro kids who were always trying that, who were only trying to go to school. I'd seen the pictures, but I didn't know how these white people could hate kids so much. I've seen it. I didn't have to tell dad. I didn't understand. Well, a lot of times that's going to be the way the world is for us. Byron is getting old enough to understand that his time for playing around is running out fast. He's got to realize that the world doesn't have a lot of jokes waiting for him. He's got to be ready. Dad looked at me again to make sure I was understanding. I nodded. Grandma Sand says it's real quiet where they are but we think it's time Byron got our idea of what of the place the world can be. And maybe spending some time down south will help him open his eyes. I nodded my head again. Mama and I are very worried because there are so many things that can go wrong to a young person and Byron seems bound and determined to find every one of them. Now, do you really understand why we're sending Byron to Birmingham? I think so, Dad. Good, because Kenny, we've done all that we can do and it seems the temptations are just too much for Bai here in Flint. So hopefully the slower pace in Alabama will help him by removing some of those temptations. Hopefully he can see that there, there comes a time to let all of this silliness go. Bai will be back, maybe at the end of the summer, maybe next year. It's completely in his own hands now. I love when dad talked to me like I was a grown up. I really didn't understand half the junk he was saying, but it sure did feel good to be talked to like that. It's times like this when someone is talking to you like you're a grown up that you have to be careful not to pick your nose or dig your drawers, <laughs> dig, put your hands in, put your hands in your pants. Okay, dad, thanks. He smiled again and turned the ultra glide back up and ran his hand over my head. Some of the time when you think about being a grown up, it gets to be kind of scary. I couldn't figure out how mama and dad knew how to take care of things. I couldn't figure out how they knew what to do with Byron. Dad, hmm? You don't think I'll, I don't think I'll ever know what to do when I'm a grown up. It seems like you and mama know a lot of things that I can never learn. It seems real scary. I don't think I will ever be as good a parent as you guys. Dad turned the ultra glide back down. Kenny, 
Do you remember when we used to go on drives and I'd put you in the lap and let you steer the car? I smiled. Yeah, does that mean I get to do that on the way to Alabama? Sure, but that's not what I meant. Do you remember how big and scary the car seemed to be the first time you were behind the wheel? Dad was right. Even though I knew he was watching everything real close, it was really scary to steer the brown bomber. Well, that's what being an adult, a grown-up is like at first. At first, it's scary, but then you realize, with a lot of practice, you have it under control. Hopefully, you'll have lots of practice being a grown-up before you actually have to do it. This was making sense to me. As far as you being a good parent, don't worry. You'll learn from your mistakes your mother and I make, just like we learn from the mistakes our parents made. I don't have a single doubt that you and Byron and Joey will be much better parents than your mother and I were. Besides, some of the time we don't think we've done such we we don't think we've done such a good job, but you're right, Kenny. It can be scary, and it gets a lot scarier when you see you're responsible for three lives. A whole lot scarier. I waited to see if dad was going to talk to me like this anymore, but he turned the music back up. We listened to his junk a little more and then I said, Dad? Yeah? I've got one more question. He turned the ultra glide down a little and he gave me a serious look. What do you want to know, Kenny? Is it too late to get yakety yak? Dad laughed and sent me in to get it. I had to promise, promise to only play it three times though. After the third time, I asked Dad, Dad, why did you buy this record player? Don't they have radio stations in Alabama? Sure, they do, lots of them, but you will see, once we get south of Cincinnati, the only kind of radio station you can get is hillbilly music. And you won't believe this, but if you listen to any kind of music long enough, first you get accustomed to it, and then you start to like it. Now, your mother and I made a deal when we first got married that if either of us ever watched the wonderful, wonderful Lawrence Welk show or listened to that country music or the other one got to get a free divorce, I'm kind of used, I'm getting it kind of used to your mother and I don't want her have to dump me. So instead of taking the chance I'd get hooked on hillbilly music, I thought this would be wise to bring along our own songs sounds with us. Even though this made sense, Mama didn't buy it, and for the next week, while we were getting everything set for going to Alabama, she kept reminding Dad how much the Ultra Glide cost and how it messed up all the plans she had written in her notebook. Me and Joey were in the living room playing when Mama and our neighbor, Mrs. Davidson, came in. Hello, Joetta. Hello, Kenneth. Hi, Mrs. Davidson. I noticed right away that she had something behind her back. She said, since I won't be seeing you for a while, I thought I'd give you something so you wouldn't forget about me, sweetheart. She stuck a box towards Joey. I could kill Joey the way she opened presents. Instead of ripping the paper, wrapping paper off, she hunted around to find each piece of tape, then peeled it off real careful. It took her about two days to get all the paper off and open the box. Joey finally held up her present. I didn't think Mrs. Davison noticed, but I could tell there was something that Joey wasn't too happy about. She looked at Mama real quick, and Mama looked at her. Then Joey said, thank you very much, Mrs. Davidson. Mama smiled. Mrs. Davidson took the present from Joey and handed it to Mama. See, Walona, it's just like I told you. Look at that smile. The minute I saw it, it reminded me of Joetta. Is that her smile or what? In fact, do you know what I named this angel? Joey pretended she was stupid and said, no, Mrs. Davidson, I've named her after my favorite little girl. This angel's name is Joetta. I looked, I went over for a closer look. Mrs. Davidson had brought Joey a little angel that was kind of chubby and had big wings and a halo made out of straw. The only thing about its smile that looked like Joey to me was that the angel had a great big dimple too. It was made out of white clay and it looked like someone had forgotten to paint it. The only thing that had any color on it were its cheeks and eyes. The cheeks were red and the eyes were blue. Maybe Mrs. Davis said, Ooh, child, give me one more big hug before you go. Joey got up and hugged Mrs. Davidson, then took her angel and said, I'm going to put her in my room. Thank you, Mrs. Davidson. You're welcome, precious. Mrs. Davidson looked like she was going to cry. We all know she'd kidnap Joey if she had the chance. She liked her that much. When Mrs. Davidson left, Left, Mama went upstairs and into Joey's room. I eavesdropped. They were both sitting on Joey's bed. 
I was very proud of you for the way you behaved, Joetta. What was wrong? That angel, Mommy. Oh? Mrs. Davidson said it reminded her of me, but it didn't look like me at all. Mama looked around the room. Where do you put it? It's in my sock drawer. Joey was so neat, she had a separate drawer for her socks. Mama went and got the angel and sat next to Joey. Sweetheart, I can see how it reminds her of you. Look at that dimple. But Mommy, it's white. Mama laughed. Well, honey, I, I can't say it isn't, but an angel's an angel. What do you think? Huh, maybe. I don't know what angel's name isn't Joe, but, but maybe. But I know that angel's name isn't Joetta Watson. Well, I'm glad you didn't hurt Mrs. Davidson's feelings. Keep the angel around. You might get to like it. Where do you want me to put it? Back under the socks? Mama laughed. The only one who didn't do anything to get ready to go to Alabama was Byron. He acted like nothing was going to happen, even though Mama got a bunch of our clothes together and put them in suitcases. The smelly green pine tree was hung from the rear view mirror and all the lists and figuring were done, but Byron acted like he didn't notice. Even after a few more yelling phone calls were made to Alabama, Daddy Cool just kept on being cool. Byron didn't even get nervous when Mom had packed a whole bunch of food and the giant green cooler he, we had borrowed from the Johnsons. After all this stuff, it was finally the night before we were supposed to leave. we just gone in bed, Byron was up on the bunk, and I was down on mine, and I was so excited that I was talking a mile a minute, but I was talking to myself. Byron wouldn't answer or anything. Then there was a knock on our bedroom door. Come in. It was Mama and Dad. Mama said, lights out, Byron. Kenneth. Byron, you come with us. What for? We thought since this was your last night, you were going to be spending in Flint for a while that you might like to sleep in our room tonight. You thought what? Byron had a way of saying stuff in a, in a few words that made it seem like he was saying a whole bunch more. Come on, by. You're bunking with us tonight, Dad said. Aw, man. Byron jumped out of the top bunk and he gave me the death stare. I just shrugged. I guess the grapevine had gotten back to Mama and Dad that Byron was going to make a prison break tonight before he got transferred to Alabama. He thought he thought I was the sit, but it was Joey. She she knew if Mom and Daddy got up early in the morning and Byron had flew the coop that he'd really be a dead man when they finally recaptured him. So I guess she saved his life by snitching, but Bye sure didn't appreciate it. I sneaked out of the bed after Mama and Dad arrested Byron. I was too excited to sleep and too excited to read. I looked out of the window at the brown bomber and couldn't believe it was going to take us all the way to Alabama. The trip didn't become real to us until 9 in the morning when we were in the car, waving goodbye to Rufus and heading toward I-75, a road that runs all the way from Flint to Florida. One road. We weren't even on the expressway before Mama started reading out of her notebook, telling us everything that was planned for the next three days. Day one, today, we leave Flint and drive for 300 miles in about five or six, uh, in about five or five and a half hours that will take us to Cincinnati. 300 miles in one day. It just didn't seem like that could be done. Me and Joey shook our heads and Byron just looked out the window. In Cincinnati, we'll get a room in a motel. We have plenty of blankets so you kids will be able to sleep on the floor. Me and Joey cheered. We've never been in a motel before. Byron just kept looking out the window. Day two, tomorrow. Now your daddy and this car ain't as young as they used to be, so we don't want to push either of them too hard. Dad looked shocked. So we rise and shine early in the morning and drive for 250 miles in about five or six hours. That should put us right outside of Knoxville, Tennessee. Mr. Johnson says there are some clean, safe rest stops there so we can spend the night in the car. If that's true, we'll stay there. If not, we'll have to see if we can find a motel in Knoxville. Day three, Monday. This is going to be a tough day for your daddy because he's going to have to drive more than six hours. After we leave Knoxville, we've got about 300 miles to go. If we leave early, we'll be pulling into home about three in the afternoon. Mama turned the page in her notebook. We're going to be able to stop once a day on the way down for hamburgers and once a day on the way back. Me and Joey cheered again at the news. Byron acted like he didn't hear. Now, if we sleep in the car outside Knoxville, we can add one more bonus time coming and going. Otherwise, the cooler in the trunk is full of chicken, soda pop, potato salad, sandwiches, and fruit for the whole trip down. I'm sure Grandma Sands will have everything set for the way back. 
I thought about it for a minute, then asked, Mama, how can we just don't drive until Dad gets tired and then stop? Dad made an imitation of a hillbilly accent. Cause boy, this here is the deep south. You all is gonna be driving through. Y'all colored folks can't just be pulling up to oh any which way and be expecting to get no room or no food, you hear boy? I said, you hear what I'm saying, boy? Me and Joy laughed. And even though By Byron kind of smiled, this only encouraged Dad to say more some more Southern style stuff. You know you didn't know you didn't know that boy? What's the matter with you? You think this is America here? Mama had planned everything about the trip. I mean everything. Where we'd eat, when we'd eat, who got bologna sandwiches on day one, who got tuna fish on day two, who got peanut butter and jelly on day three. How long we'd have to hold ourselves between going to the bathroom, how much money we'd spend on hamburgers, how much was for any emergency, everything. She'd, fig fi she'd figured out who'd get the window on each day and who was responsible for keeping paper and junk from piling up in the car. When she was finished reading all that stuff to us, I asked her if I could see her notebook. She handed it to me and I saw written on the cover in big black letters, the Watsons go to Birmingham, 1963. She'd even drawn a picture of a flower with a big fat stupid bird trying to land on it. Mama, man, Mama sure is a bad artist. Why is that bird trying to land on a flower, Mama? Dad cracked up, cracked up. Ooh, Kimeth, I'd asked her the same thing and she was highly offended. Mama said, that's a bee, not a bird. I guess if you squinted your eyes, you might get, you might, it might look like a bee, but not too much. Mom had also gone to the library to look up stuff about every state we'd traveled through. We heard a bunch of boring junk about the expressway, how many years it took to finish it, how many miles long it was, how much it cost to build it, how it ran all the way from the Upper Pencil Peninsula in Michigan to Florida, all kinds of thrilling news. The only thing that was a little bit interesting was how many people got hurt or killed making the road. You never would think getting, putting an expressway down was so dangerous. She'd brought books and magazines and puzzles too. She really did try to make the trip interesting. The most interesting part for me though was going to be Byron. Two days before we left, Buphead came by for a visit to Byron. The three of us were in my and Bi's bedroom. They were sitting in the upper bunk and I was in the lower one. Man, Bubhead complained, I couldn't live with your old man. He'll oh, we'd be coming to blows every day, Jack. What could I say? Byron answered, not much. I can't believe they're gonna make you spend the whole blank summer in that hot old Alabama. Shoot, I'd find somewhere else to say. You're gonna be as black as an ace of spades when you get back. They got, they, they, they got some sure enough sun down there. Yeah, but dig. I get a way to pay them jive. I, I got a way to pay them to pay them jive old squares back. Yeah, what are you gonna do? I ain't even sure I'm gonna go, but I do know how I, how they. I do know how they is. They're trying to be some like Ozzy and Harriet TV show mess on the way down. You know, playing games and counting cows and guessing how many red cars we're gonna see in the next two miles and all that three, nine, six, and I'm ready for him. Yeah? Yeah, I I got something that'll mess that junk up for him. What's that, Daddy-o? Byron remembered I was still in the lower bunk and stuck his head over the edge, then pointed at me. You say a word about this to anyone and I'm gonna jack your little weight up, the lightweight behind up, you hear? I said, oh man. Bye disappeared back into the top bunk. Yeah, bump head. If I do go, I'm going to go that whole blank trip, and no matter what they do to me, I ain't going to say a single word. Whoa, how long the trip going to take? Three days. Cool, that'll show them. They slapped palms, and Bye said, yeah, you know it will. But as soon as we got to Detroit, Byron said, how are we going to work this record player? Dad looked in the rearview mirror and said, and, and said to Bye, what do you mean? We gonna take turns? Well, Byron, I don't think we'll be playing it for quite a for quite a for quite a bit yet. We can carry CKLW all the way down into Ohio, and they play some pretty good music. But when we do play it, we gonna take turns? Sure. Cool. Am I first? Sure. We'll go by seniority. 
dad was in the United Auto Workers at, at work, so seniority was real important to him at our house. Cool. I couldn't help myself. I leaned over Joey and said kind of quiet to buy, I guess you really showed them, didn't you? Boy, they were really begging you to talk, weren't they, daddy-o? Byron made sure that Joey wasn't looking and he crossed his eyes and, and he, he, he made his eyes go crossed. On the left side, kids, is Tiger Stadium. Mama was pointing out at the, all the important things we passed on the way. As the, as the payback, I said out loud to buy, how many cows you counted by? How many red cars so far? He gave me his famous death stare, then leaned over Joey and whispered, no cars, no cows, but I counted your mama six times already. I couldn't believe it. What kind of person would talk about their own mama? I said, that's your mama too, stupid. I knew he didn't care though, but I, but I had to get him back. So I called him the only thing that bothered him. You might have counted my mama six times, but have you counted your mouth lately? You lipless wonder. I got him, he showed his teeth and he said, you little, and he started to grab me. Dad's eye was in the rear view mirror. All right, you two, no nonsense. I don't, I, and I don't, I don't mean, and I don't mean maybe. Byron, Byron used silent language, silent mouth language to say, I'm gonna jack you up in Alabama, you punk. So as we drove down I-75 headed for Birmingham, I felt pretty good. Even though every time I looked at by, his eyes were crossed. I didn't care, but this was the last, this was one time I bugged him more than he had bugged me. And that is the end of chapter nine. I'll see you next time.